Good evening. I'd like to call the August 16th, 2018 board meeting of Johnson County Community College trustees to order. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call and recognition of visitors. Terry? This evening's visitors include Leanne Lumen, Lauren Beeves, Brian Batliner, Dennis Batliner, Cheryl Batliner, and Roberta Eveslage. Thank you. Awards and recognitions, Dr. Sopcich. Thanks, Dr. Cook. I'd like to ask Karen, uh, Karen Martley, our VP of Continuing Ed and Staff Development, to uh, take the podium. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to introduce Elisa Waldman and ask her to come forward and she'll do the recognition tonight for her clients that are here with her. Elisa is the Regional Director of the Kansas Small Business Development Center here at JCCC. Good evening, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, as you may recall, every year our Small Business Development Center State Network honors exceptional emerging and existing business owners uh, from all eight of our regions. This year, we recognized 16 emerging and existing business owners out of almost 3,000 business clients that we serve across Kansas. In your packets tonight, you will find success stories about the two honorees that are before you this evening. The award ceremony takes place in Topeka every March. Uh, the business owners are honored during both House and Senate sessions, and then their legislators present them with awards at an evening ceremony. The criterion for the honors take into consideration metrics like job creation, sales increase, but as we're considering who to honor, we really look at the qualities of the business owner. This year's JCCC honorees are dedicated to continuous improvement in their businesses and in our community. They are always learning and growing. In fact, both of this year's honorees not only work individually with one of our SBDC business advisors, but they also participate in our game strategic planning sessions and in quarterly business advisory reviews with our entire team. They are in it. <laughs> they have formed relationships with many of our other clients as well through the game program, um, and they offer insights to those business owners as well as uh, gain from them. So they, they give as much as they take, and that is, is one of the qualities we really admire in both of these business owners. We are so proud to have played a supporting role in their success. Now, for those of you who were at the all-staff meeting yesterday, Dr. Sopcich shared a preview of our 2018 Emerging Business of the Year, Angel Competition Bikinis, LLC, that is owned by sisters Kara and Lauren Beeves. And Lauren is here with us tonight. Kara looks just like Lauren. <laughs> so if you squint really hard and see two, you, they are identical twins. <laughs> um, while pursuing their passion for competition bodybuilding, the sisters struggle to find quality competition suits. Their frustration led to action. They launched Angel Competition Bikinis in 2014. They quickly exceeded sales forecasts and demand, and they reached out to the Small Business Development Center for help in managing their success. They met with Stephanie Landis, one of our SBDC advisors, and began honing in on every area of operation. Sales have continued to climb, and in 2018, Angel Competition Bikinis purchased a 6,000 square foot building to house its manufacturing operation. Today, Lauren and Kara work with all of us in different capacities. They are always eager, eager to improve upon their already excellent processes. Our 2018 existing business of the year is Casey Restoration LLC, and that is owned by Leanne and Bill Lumen. In 2011, Leanne and Bill moved to Johnson County from California to seek a better education for their daughter. They left their former careers as a school teacher and a police captain to launch Casey Restoration in Kansas City, filling a niche in commercial refinishing of metal, stone, wood, and patina. And you have likely already appreciated their craftsmanship in many of the buildings in our area. Early work with the SBDC centered on classification of independent contractors versus employees, marketing, search engine optimization, compensation, Today, they allow us to assist them with strategic planning and growth in every area. 
Um, in addition to our award that they received in 2018, Casey Restoration was recently celebrated as one of the top 10 businesses in Kansas City by the Kansas City, Missouri Greater Chamber, as well as one of the 25 outstanding businesses with under 25 employees. Both of these teams are role models. We are so proud to have been a small part of their success, and we are so proud of their affiliation with the Small Business Development Center and the college. So, thank you. Uh, so without um, taking care of any special announcements, when and where will the launch of the JCCC edition of the bikini <laughs> be held in the bookstore? Is that coming forward? And perhaps Casey Restoration could do a metallic version of such, <laughs> and you could partner. But congratulations. We heard about it uh, with Dr. Sobchak's comments, and you both uh, have great companies with great stories. Would you like to say a few words? I just want to thank you for your investment in this program. Like I said, I was an elementary school teacher. Third grade math was the highest I had had, now I'm CFO. And I, with the help <laughs> of um, this program, I've gotten so much assistance from the advisors. And it's helped me not only have a successful business, but offer jobs to people, hire the teachers that have come and helped their businesses as well. It's been an all win, and I don't know where we would have been without you. So thank you so much for investing in the program. I just want to say how much the SBDC has helped my business. It would not be near where it is today without the help. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much and uh, continued success. And thanks to the uh, work at the SBDC uh, office. It helps many businesses. Every year, I think we saw some detail on that recently, and it's very, very impressive. This is time for the open forum. The open forum section of the board agenda is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are encouraged, are asked to remain at the podium, should be respectful and civil, and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggested processes or are otherwise subject to the review of the college board. We have one registered speaker tonight. Uh, that is Brian Batliner. Brian, would you come forward, please? give your address, Brian, that'd be helpful. Yep. 11420 West 104th Street, Overland Park, 66214. All right. um, well, I'm here tonight to uh, continue to, to just to talk about the track issue. I know that um, you guys have been hearing us from us for about eight months now. And, um, you know, as you all know, I was a coach here uh, in this program. And I just really think it's important to continue, despite all of us probably being a little bit exhausted, to at least, at least keep this relevant and hopefully someday we'll get to a point where we can talk about a way to uh, open these opportunities back up for kids in our community. Um, so, so I think a lot gets said about why we started this and, and uh, behind the scenes and, and you know I just thought it was really important to come out and make sure that you know I, I get us back to where the mission started from all of us that have, have been coming and speaking and um, emailing you and all that and, and where it started at least for me was you know I was a coach here and, and for me it's not just about cutting track it's about cutting stories and opportunities from, from this campus. Um, and, and you know, last month you heard about Jaleesa White, uh, who's an athlete I coached here. Phenomenal story. Uh, you know, she, she, she actually, sidebar, when I started out as assistant coach here, uh, I was told that you couldn't be in the nursing program here and be a track athlete, because it was just too much to handle, because nursing's just way too rigorous. And uh, uh, Jaleesa proved that to be wrong. She came here and was a, a nursing student, got through her clinicals, was a four-time All-American on the track, and uh, by the way, she, she raised her infant daughter and uh, worked nights to do it. So just an incredible story. Um, so I think about, when I think about this program being cut, I think about those stories. I think about a guy named Kinesia Rayner who came all the way here from Jamaica. And the story about Kinesia is that when he got off the airplane at KCI Airport, he had literally only the clothes on his back, a little small backpack, and he didn't even have a pair of socks. We got him some socks. 
And the community came around Kinesia and lifted it up. But you know what? Kinesia, guys like him, influence our community and our athletics department all the way up to Carl Heinrich himself. If you ask him about Kinesia, he'll tell you great things. He was a light, he, he, he was a credible work ethic and, and just uh, a light to everyone around him. So those are what I think about. And that's why I think it's important for us to continue to come out here and just you know, have, a, have a voice and keep this relevant. Um, we talk to community members, we see them out at the track, it's still open. A lot of them find out for the first time that the track's going away from us and they, they, they can't believe it. Um, I talk to people in my daily life and, and I, I, they hear about it for the first time from me and they go, really, Johnson County's cutting track? It's the most participated in sport in our community. How could we not figure that out? So we want to we want to keep working towards a solution. Uh, we want to work together with you all. Um, we want to come up with innovative and fun ways to try to, to keep the issue relevant. Um, so so we uh, we saw Dr. Chopchek's challenge at the Lace Up for Learning 5K, and uh, he, he's going to donate five dollars for every person that's able to beat him. Uh, in, in that race, and, and it's going to go to scholarships. And we do care about this college because uh, it affected all of us deeply. <laughs> so, uh, so we created an event called uh, Race the President, Save the Track, uh, just to keep the issue going. And uh, we're going to try to make it the biggest 5K that we've ever had here for Lace Up for Learning and bring as many people out as we can and, and support the college. So I saw you ran about 24 minutes the last time you ran a 5K, so that's pretty good. What do you run it in? Uh, when I was here, about 15 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm way out of shape. It's been a long time. So, so anyway, I hope training is going well. Uh, we're going to try to bring as many people out. And, and uh, you know, we want a solution. We really, we really believe in what these programs can bring to the college. And, and you know, I've emailed all of you. You all have my phone number. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk anytime. I have a lot to, to bring to the discussion. And, and um, there's ways to do this. So thank you. Brian, thank you for your passion and, and for your presentation. Uh, we've, we've dealt with the, the issue a number of times and we try not to respond in open forum. We had a couple of board members respond last meeting. Uh, Trustee Lawson has some remarks she'd like to make, so Trustee Lawson, if you would, please. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you so much for the track to come. I appreciate your motivation. Um, because I was not here during this decision, uh, uh, when I, everyone was elected here. I have taken a lot of time to do the research be, uh, based on the concern that you brought up. Uh, after my uh, understanding, if I was on this board back then, I would vote the same way the board has done now. Um, I believe that JCCC is a premier educational facility that was recently in the news stated as uh, the best community college in America. Um, a big part of that is the strong commitment we have to academic excellence. Uh, I'm proud that you are, you know, motivated and you get up here and you talk about the track, but I'm also reminded that our English and infotech and career tech and history and science and art, uh, sustainability and nursing and continuing ed, um, they do not have the cheerleaders. And it is up to the board to be their cheerleaders. Uh, having reviewed information, it appears to me that the decision was made in the best interest of this college uh, financially because it allows to make sure that the academic accomplishments continue without added cost. Um, decisions like this um, were you know, not taken lightly, um, and because of the vision of the college, we are able to provide stable access, affordable tuition, and recently tax relief for the residents of Johnson County. Uh, knowing all of this, I believe that the, this is the right decision. I believe that any choice that lowers access by increasing costs or decisions that taxes all of Johnson County residents um, when we don't have to is probably not in the best interest of the college. Thank you. Having uh, given Trustee Lost the chance, any other comments that any trustee would like to make? Close the open forum. Uh, thanks, Brian. and. Uh, We'll move on to the college lobbyist report. Mr. Carter. Good evening. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to present the election edition of the legislative update. Um, that's what uh, this, this report will primarily be a, about. And, and one of the sayings that we have, uh, those of us that work in and around the legislature, is that it's never over till it's over, and it's never over. And that seems to be the the motto for this year's um, primary election. The, uh, the governor's race, while, while Governor Collier has conceded the, the race, uh, technically still is not over. 345 votes separate 
um, Collier and Kobach at this point with 17 precincts left to be um, counted, uh, the provisional ballots to be counted. Uh, I think that uh, we're at a point where things are moving forward, but all of those votes and tallies will be finalized on August 20th when the Board of Canvassers meet to, uh, to confirm all of the tallies for all the races across Kansas. Uh, it's suggested that uh, at least uh, some of the data that we're receiving says that, um, that the Trump endorsement provided about a 7% bump for um, candidate Kobach for those that maybe were undecided. And so when you look at a five-way primary um, in a race, and we had those in several um, statewide races, um, that, that really uh, shows how every vote counts and every vote is important. Uh, the, the mere fact that three, four, 345 votes um, separate the, uh, the two. The, uh, the Democrat candidate in the governor's race will be Laura Kelly. Uh, she's a state senator from Topeka. Um, she won quite handily uh, in her primary. Uh, and, and just if it were the two, uh, the Republican and, and Democrat, the two-party system, uh, if that were the general race, it would be an interesting race in and of itself just to watch. Uh, you add to that mix the, uh, the introduction of an independent candidate, and there's also a libertarian candidate, and uh, it is going to be a very uh, interesting Kansas general election to watch for that particular race. A lot is at stake. Um, one of those candidates is from, from right here in Johnson County. One of those candidates has served on uh, a city council at one point in his career uh, in Johnson County. And so there, um, it will be uh, an interesting contest to, to watch. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for the college? What does it mean for the state? Uh, we know a little bit um, at this point. At least we know what the candidates have, have said uh, they will do or, or not do. Um, for the Republican uh, candidate, um, we, we certainly think that one of the first things that will happen is the repeal of the in-state tuition for, for undocumented students. Um, we know that um, he is very strong on Second Amendment issues. And as far as governing uh, as a fiscal conservative, I think he would come from the same, same standpoint of returning any uh, new revenues or reducing uh, tax dollars um, or giving that windfall back to the taxpayer. Um, you can think about what that means then in terms of either the K-12 education issue that the court has extended for another year uh, or for general budgets um, for those that receive money um, from the state of Kansas. Uh, similarly, um, candidate Kelly, uh, who has always maintained an A rating um, from the National Rifle Association, um, certainly approaches um, gun issues in, in a more uh, reasonable or sensible uh, from that standpoint. Um, she was on the Higher Education Budget Subcommittee uh, on behalf of the Senate Ways and Means Committee and so has voted on um, budgets for higher education and, and um, not exactly sure where she would come down on um, in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants, but I think, I think we have a fairly good idea. With Orman, it's a little bit more of a, um, an unknown. He has not had to get specific yet. I think you'll see that um, here in the near future. Um, there have been plenty of ads, at least on the television market, that, that we have in Topeka uh, from him, and they're general feel-good ads. I think you're going to start seeing ads um, not only in the form of postcards and, and on the radio and on TV that are a little bit more targeted, a little bit more pointed, and he will have to uh, define himself a little bit more on where he uh, comes down on many of the policy issues. With regard to the, um, the election in the House, um, the House of Representatives is going to have a very different face come 2019. Um, by by a, a good guess and, and by counting sort of who won and lost some of the primary contests, as well as the fact that some of those seats were open uh, in those primary contests. Uh, it looks like six moderates, uh, six moderate Republicans have lost, uh, but there was also some, some change uh, on, on those uh, on the conservative side as well. Uh, a good example is um, our higher education budget chair who was from Wellsville, a uh, very conservative Republican was running for Congress. There was a two-way uh, primary for that seat and the moderate candidate um, won that, that race. That moderate candidate happens to be an attorney who works here in Johnson County. 
So again, it's kind of important to realize that while we have the delegation that's right here uh, in Johnson County, um, there are other connections that, that uh, will benefit us in the long run. Uh, specifically in Johnson County, uh, we lost um, representatives Markley and Coaston who were strong supporters of education and higher education, and so we'll be watching those races as well. There's a number of other races in Johnson County as well that, that could trend one way or the other. Um, some of them are open seats. Uh, one example is uh, up in the northwestern part of the county uh, where a moderate held the seat, did not run. Um, someone, uh, it was a several way primary on both sides. Someone ran uh, who had previously held the seat and uh, who is a little bit more conservative and beat the moderate candidate. And so again, we, it's too early to say where we think we'll be uh, in terms of distribution of, of where people are gonna come down on, on many of the issues, but kind of gives you a sense of, of what is happening uh, across the state. And, and what happened here in Johnson County uh, is not exclusive to this region or this area. It was, was occurring all, all across the state. The Senate's gonna look a little different too. Um, we are hearing that uh, the Senate president may uh, be up for an appointment um, at the national level or may receive some other type of uh, of job offer that opens up not only that Senate seat, but the position of Senate president. Um, we have um, a Johnson County resident who is the Senate majority leader who uh, could very well be interested in that, in that seat. The Senate vice president um, out of Emporia uh, is also interested in that seat. Uh, we have a sitting Senator who won um, the primary for insurance commissioner um, and that guarantees her essentially the spot of, of the Kansas Insurance Commissioner, and so there will be a new uh, senator uh, appointed to that seat at some point, uh, probably around the, the start of the legislative session. So again, even the Senate is going to look a little bit different. Senators were not up for an election this year. They will be in 2020. So that kind of gives you a, a little um, a snapshot of, of what happened uh, on August 7th, um, the, earlier this month, with regard to the primary election. The general is on November 6th. Um, my encouragement is always don't forget to vote. I know we have many um, trustees and, and others around the table that will also provide that reminder. It is, it's incredibly important to participate in the process. And so I hope that, hope that, that follows through with, with everyone heading to the polls uh, on November 6th. Let me talk about the budget a little bit. Uh, we entered the state's fiscal year, uh, which started on July 1, um, $11 million ahead uh, at, the end of, at the end of the first month of the fiscal year. That marks 14 uh, consecutive <coughs> months where we've had positive returns on uh, receipts to, Kansas, the, to the Kansas coffers. That hasn't happened since the 1960s. It's been over 50 years um, since there has been that type of uh, dollars flowing into the state's bank account. Almost all of the uh, increase can be attributed to the individual income tax policy changes that uh, were passed by the 2017 legislature, which were an effect of the 2012 and 13 legislatures where the, the tax policies were, were um, changed at that time. Uh, I will say that something that, that will, it not, doesn't necessarily apply to um, the college or budgets, uh, but one thing that, that is in, uh, Worth watching is the sales tax collections. They continue to go down and be flat. And that is uh, entirely because of uh, online sales and uh, the leakage that we experience in this state from the sale of goods um, where, where uh, sales tax is not paid. The Supreme Court recently addressed that issue. Um, the state of Kansas has passed laws uh, recently addressing that issue as well. And so I think we'll continue to see some some movement in that area, but as far as things are going right now, um, the budget receipts continue to flow in uh, at a positive rate. A little bit more specific to the college, the Board of Regents meets every August for their annual retreat. And uh, it was last week or the week before that they were, were meeting uh, over in Manhattan. And uh, what came out of their, uh, uh, their meetings as far as priorities for the legislature uh, would be some increased budget numbers. Uh, and you'll recall that last year we all got around the same table with regard to restoring the cuts. Um, it's a little bit similar uh, this year, except the numbers are different. Uh, there will be uh, a recommendation coming from the board for $50 million for the first um, budget year for state universities. 
Uh, that is, those include dollars to restore uh, the base and I believe a couple of other programs um, that, I don't know if they've been specified yet or not, but a couple of other programs that are included in that number. The second year uh, asked for state universities would be around 35 million. And so again, that, that gets state universities back up to the level where they were prior to a number of cuts that have been made over, over the past several years. For the community college, tech college, Washburn sector, uh, the ask would be 23 million um, for both years. And that includes an increase in the base um, that, that we've seen where, where that hasn't been corrected. Uh, it includes tiered and non-tiered um, courses as well as um, classes related to the concurrent program and then the career and tech ed uh, dollars. So again, those will all be formulated and passed along to the budget committee uh, later on in November and December. That will be the request uh, that everyone will be getting around the, the table for just like we did last year, um, locking elbows with all of the higher education partners going with one message. I believe that there's going to be some additional requests from, from the board for um, additional folks, including administration, to get involved with visiting legislators, um, both prior to the session as well as, as once the session occurs. We're still waiting on some detail on that, but I learned of that this afternoon uh, in a conference call just before the noon hour. So I think that that kind of catches us up to date on, on where things have been for uh, up, to, up to this point in the summer. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. So um, to start it off, and let me show my ignorance on gubernatorial elections. If a gubernatorial candidate concedes, and then after the official votes come in, ends up winning, what happens? I was hoping you wouldn't ask that question. <laughs> um, uh, the numbers tell the story, and, and I think that that ends up being the final uh, record, the final record. I think that, I, I don't think that the candidate would have conceded uh, if the writing was not clear on the wall, so to speak. Um, but I do believe that the final vote tally is, is the record. Okay, Trustee Lawson. Uh, I just wanted to point out that Greg, Mr. Greg Orman is not an, a certified candidate, so at this point he should, he should not be seen as a candidate, correct? Uh, he did submit uh, the, the remaining signatures as I understand it. I don't know that they've been verified. Yeah, um, I so think I think that there was a discrepancy yet. in the number of, of um, signatures that he initially submitted, and uh, I believe the, the word that we heard in Topeka was that uh, there was an ample amount, I think is, is the way it was, was termed of um, signatures turned in. But you're, you're correct, I believe, at this point. He's not a certified candidate. Any other uh, questions of trustees? Dr. Sopcich. Uh, Dick, with regards to the KBR request for funding, do you recall, I don't know if, if, you, if you do, I don't, the last time where the community colleges and the universities were, went arm in arm uh, through the state house lobbying? Uh, other than last year, for the restoration of the cuts, I do not. And so we can actually go ourselves lobby, unlike any issue pertaining to weapons, we can't do anything, right? Well, we're still, we're still uh, restricted by state law uh, to some respect with that issue as far as advocating or not advocating um, for, for or against, rather, um, gun control. Um, but there are other issues that, that will be on the table that are non-budgetary that, that we'll also be working for or against. Trustee Cross, are you still, are you still out there somewhere? Here, do you have a question? Um, I think that's a song. I do, yes, sir. Um, I am unclear how this is not a First Amendment violation, that we cannot go speak out or discuss something like any opposition or stance we might have with respect to local control on the gun issue. How, how is that not a First Amendment violation? That might be more of a question for Tanya than it is for Mr. Carter. I was going to say, that issue has been raised, uh, and I would agree, it's a question more for Tanya than it is for Mr. Carter. <laughs> Do you want to come? It hasn't been formally challenged at this point by any entity, so mm -hmm. how that would play out and be ruled on Did you hear her response, Lee? It, it hasn't been formally yeah, challenged. Been. It hasn't been formally well, challenged. Well, I can find a lawyer to challenge it. <laughs> so. I think the answer is that none of us are individually prohibited from doing that. What we are prohibited from doing by statute, whether it's valid or not, is using public funds to 
be a reimbursed mileage or to use letterhead or compute, you know, those things that are funded by public dollars to advocate for or against anything related to gun or pump gun safety. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's wrong headed policy, but I don't know that there's anything we can do about it tonight. Thank you for addressing that. I might just add one thing that's extra. Um, I'm working with an, another um, group who uh, is introducing a, um, a policy statement as part of their legislative policy um, platform for the 2019 legislature, and they're including a statement uh, unlike I've ever seen before in, in anything, and, and maybe we want to look at that when the Government Affairs Task Force gets together and reviews the, um, the standing positions that the college has, has developed over the past several years. And it's, a, it's a, um, a bullet point that speaks specifically to maintaining um, the ability to voice your message um, under the First Amendment. And, and I can get the, the exact wording that the other group is, is proposing to include in their, in their policy statement, but um, it's the first time I've ever seen anything like that included in a legislative platform. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Well, I, I think it's, we're gonna get into it in the budget hearing later but I think while Dick's up here, I'm looking at our general fund resources by source from 2010 to 2019, because there, there are some candidates that say we, we haven't cut enough. 18% of this, you know, this college's budget was funded by state, the state in 2010, 13% will be funded next year. Every year I've been on here, we have budgeted the same amount as the prior year, minus 10%, assuming there was a cut coming. So that has been made up by Johnson County residents instead of any kind of statewide uh, revenues. Johnson County residents were paying 58% through their property taxes in 2010, and in 2019 will pay 65%. So I think it is important that when we, we consider a candidate uh, for the legislature or for governor, we recognize that what has happened over the last nine fiscal years is to transfer the significant uh, increase in the burden uh, for, the, for supporting this college to Johnson County residents, which Johnson County residents have, have supported, and we're lucky that we're, we're blessed enough to do that. But I thought it was important as I look at those and hear that, you know, what the state government might do next year. Okay, any other comments or questions from the trustees? Thank you, Mr. Carter. You. Good luck. At our July board meeting, we announced uh, the hearing for our 2018-19 budget. It is now time for our budget 2018-19 uh, uh, budget public hearing. I will now open that hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on the budget for 2018-2019? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on the 2018-2019 budget? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on the 2018-2019 budget? Do any of the trustees have a question of Rachel Lears or Barbara Larson regarding the 2018-19 budget? I realize that we'll be voting on that in the management report, but this would be a good time if you have any other questions. Trustees. If not, we will close the budget hearing and move on. Thank you. Committee reports. First is the audit report. The Audit Committee met uh, at 8 a.m. on Thursday, August 2nd in this room. You will see the number of people that were present. Uh, Justin McDade has now taken a leadership role in the, uh, in the audit uh, procedures. Uh, he reviewed the biannual travel and expense review, uh, noting that re 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 reimbursements were found to be appropriate in all of those areas uh, necessary in substantial compliance with our policies and procedures. Ms. Boyd and Mr. McDade presented information on in-process and upcoming projects. These included the cloud computing project, which will be outsourced, the continuousing auditing project, and the business continuing planning audit. <coughs> Ms. Boyd and Mr. McDade shared updates on the implementation status of prior audit recommendations, the access control team dy dynamics project, and the stakeholder education initiatives planned by the procurement services department were highlighted. We reviewed the ethics uh, report line update, the quarterly report between April 1 of 2018 and June 30 of 2018. 11 reports were received 
uh, via the ethics report line. Six reports were received anonymously. As of June 30th, nine of those were reviewed and appropriately addressed. Uh, of the reports previously reported as in progress, all have been addressed. Uh, Ms. Boyd, with input from Dr. Weber, presented a quarterly statistical report of our COPS watch case data. We reviewed the working agenda for the 2018-2019 year, and after discussion, the draft working agenda uh, was approved to bring forward to this Board of Trustees. And so it is the recommendation of the Audit Committee that the Board of Trustees approve the fiscal year 2018-19 Audit Committee working agenda as shown subsequently in your board packet, and I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions? Any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion. Yes. Up. We have one opposed. Uh, no. No, was that a yes or a no, uh, Trustee Cross? I was moving. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes. I was moving pretty quickly. All, uh, all in favor of, thank you. Executive briefing, uh, Mr. McDade and Ms. Boyd presented an executive briefing which included additional audit recommendation follow-ups, uh, the annual trustee expense report, and the results of the post-audit surveys. And then we moved into an executive session, uh, and that completes the audit report. Uh, trustee Ingram is on that committee. Trustee Ingram, any comments? Okay, well, I do, and actually, um, it was something that wasn't noted in the minutes, but it was something that was brought up when we were looking at the recommendations um, that were kind of out ongoing, the audit recommendations for follow-up. And there were some that were listed that had closing dates on them. There were some that had target dates on them. And I just found those to be extremely helpful. I know I'm new to audit. Uh, I think you've been on it before, but I did make the comment that I felt like that would be really important. And I know um, we're thinking about that, but I, I just would like for staff to really understand that I think it's just good to have those target dates on there, and it wasn't noted in the minutes, so I did want to make a comment. Thank you. That. Any questions of the audit committee report? Hearing none, we'll move on to human resources. Trustee Cross. Trustee Cross? Thank yeah. You, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the human resources committee met at 9.30 uh, Monday, August 6th in the final conference room. Trustee Lawson and several members of the uh, administration were present, including Dr. Barbara Lawson. The consent agenda, compensation, uh, staffing tables, organizational changes were discussed. Uh, Ms. Sentlevere reviewed the compensation policy 418.04, uh, the ecologist philosophy of compensation, and the salary table for faculty positions per the 2017-18 master agreement, the pay period ranges for salary and hourly positions, an overview of initial salary placement was discussed. Uh, Dr. Larson also gave an annual report on the Retiree Benefit Trust. Uh, Ms. Chandler reviewed the 17-18 mandatory training results and provided an update on the uh, fiscal year 18-19 training. Uh, for the 18-19 training, current employees are required to complete the training by December 1, 2018. New employees must complete it within 90 days of hire. Uh, Ms. Chandler also discussed and reviewed the results of stay interviews for the fourth quarter of 2017 and the exit interviews for the second quarter of 2018. Uh, Ms. Sintlevere also reviewed the proposed Human Resources Committee working agenda for the 2018-19 academic year. And it is uh, the recommendation of, uh, that the new working agenda will be brought forth tonight and it is so, Mr. Chair, that the, the Human Resources Committee recommends to the Board of Trustees that they approve the Human Resources Committee working agenda for 2018-19 as it is so, shown subsequently in the Board packet. And I would make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? So moved. We have a second. Any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carries. <laughs> Proceed, Trustee Cross. Mr. Mr. Chair, the next Human Resources Committee meeting is scheduled for October 1, 2018 at 10 a.m. in the live conference room. And uh, I guess I would ask uh, Trustee Lawson if she has anything to add. Uh, I do not. Thank you, though. And she does not. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank, Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Lee. Thanks. 
Learning Quality, Trustee Lawson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, during the Learning Quality Committee, we was very active. We had uh, quite a few uh, presentations that were presented to us in the committee. I just wanted to highlight a few of them. They are in the board packet so that you can review more in detail. Uh, we heard from the Dean of Communications Divisions, and by the way, congratulations to Mr. Larry Reynolds. He just received uh, and was honored by the Faculty Union Association with a Distinguished Administer, um, Administrator Award. So congratulations on that. Uh, he presented on the national movement requiring American Sign Language interpreters to have a bachelor's or master's degree now. This brought up concerns that our, different, uh, that our differently abled community that are deaf had about this change. And I recently went back to uh, report on this update and the transition to the deaf community and they are in agreement and see the need to further the knowledge of interpreters. So thank you so much for your hard work on this, uh, Mr. Larry Reynolds. Uh, next, we heard reports on the Federal Trade uh, Adjustment Assistant Community College and Career Training. Say that three times fast. Uh, it was a $2.5 million four-year grant that is actually ending September 1st uh, that brought innovative IT training to our students and businesses. Most of the components have already been integrated into our core programs, and the trustees asked for continuing updates to ensure that we maintain the structures that we have built and provide opportunities for more technology advances. Uh, in the previous months, our committee uh, also brought forward updates to the board and to the public requesting alignment with KBOR, uh, Kansas Board of Regents regarding math cut scores for algebra. I want to report that the scores are now aligned. Uh, after analysis during this alignment, the pre-calculus section needed to be in the same area and the cut score as college algebra, and these will be aligned this fall, 2018. So thank you so much to Dr. McLeod and your team for helping to make that alignment. Um, the three affiliate agreement and six other agreement recommendations are in the consent agenda on page 52 and 53 of the board packet. It is the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees authorize the college and enter into these agreements when we get to the consent agenda. And that concludes my report. I'd like to ask uh, any of the other trustees that are in this committee if they have anything else to add. I do not. Do not. Any questions, Trustee Cross, any questions you have? No, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lawson. <coughs> Management Committee, Trustee Lindstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Management Committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, August 1st, uh, here in the boardroom. Information on the related to the Management Committee is, begins on page 11 and runs through page 33 of the board packet. The Management Committee received several presentations from staff, the <coughs> uh, first of which was from Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President of Finance and Administrative <coughs> Services. She presented information on agreements with a number of outside agencies. These can be found on the consent agenda uh, on pages 52 and 53 of the board packet. Randy Stang, Assistant Dean of Athletics, gave an update on activities in the athletic department, and that presentation included information on athlete recruitment and participation by sport, program revenue and revenues and costs, Title IX compliance, and the potential to expand community partnerships once updates at, to our athletic facilities are completed as part of the facilities master plan. Uh, Tom Clayton, uh, then uh, a Director of Insurance and Risk Management, then presented information about a liability reserve fund uh, that the college is considering implementing. Such a fund would be similar to the college's self-insured Workers' Compensation Fund. Mr. Clayton plans to make a formal presentation to the Management Committee in September. Barbara Larson then reviewed the <coughs> semi-annual report of budget reallocations, and this report can be found in the board packet uh, on pages 28 through 30. Janelle Vogler, Interim Associate Vice President for Business Services, presented the sole source report as the summary of awards and, and as well as the summary of awards between uh, uh, bids between twenty-five and hundred thousand dollars. That summary is on page twenty-six of the board packet. <clears throat> then Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President of Campus Services and Facility Planning, gave a monthly update on capital infrastructure projects 
and this report is on pages 31 and 32 of the board packet. He also shared current progress of the construction projects on campus. He reviewed the report on financial status of the facilities master plan uh, projects, and that report is on is in uh, on page 33 of the board packet. The management committee has three recommendations to present this evening. The first regards uh, a review of the update of the college policies. Barbara Larson and Janelle Vogler reviewed and recommended changes to the policy policies uh, related to purchasing and contracts. These policies have been reviewed as a part of a broader assessment of the college's administrative policies and procedures. And therefore, it is a recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college's administration to approve modifications to the following policies. Purchasing competitive sol uh, solicitation requirements, purchasing exceptions to competitive solicitation, and contract approval and signature authority. And also to approve the deletion of the following policies, competitive sol solicitation methods, communications with vendors and contract changes and contract change orders and I'll make that motion. Second. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Trustee uh, Ingram. I do have a question. On page 13, what caught my eye was um, about the middle of that policy, the uh, 215.01 and it just, I just would like an example of this. It says the board retains the right to deviate um, from its procurement policy as the board shall determine from time to time for the acquisition of products, goods, and services or a combination thereof. Can you give me an example of what that might be? Sure, and it would be a very rare occasion. And I did speak with Mitch Borchers today, who's recently retired but has a longer history here than, okay. than me. And I had heard about the incident before I came of a lightning stri strike that essentially wiped out our phone system. Okay. And so there would be an instance where rather than go through a, a number of weak competitive process to identify a vendor to fix that, it had to be addressed quickly. And I believe the board was informed, obviously, of that. But it was to move forward with a non-competitive uh, service. And, and that makes right. sense. I just mm -hmm. thought when I read it, I thought, sure, need an example here. And, and we, had to, we had to go back some seven, eight years to come up with that example. So. Right. And I think, Dr. Larson, that would apply to any situation of crisis yes. or uh, something that needs to be happened yes. really critically early. So. It provides the board with a little bit more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, the second uh, recommendation regarding regards to the college's uh, fiscal 2018-2019 budget. As a background, the board previously held a public hearings, uh, a public hearing on fiscal uh, year 18-19 budget. Uh, this uh, public hearing represented the culmination of a process that uh, transpires over many months, beginning with the budget guidelines that were first presented to the board in December of last year. Uh, these budget guidelines provided a policy framework for building the fiscal year 2018-2019 budget, and they were considered and adopted by the board at the December 14th, 2017 meeting this past December. Uh, furthermore, the board, had, the board held a comprehensive budget workshop in April this year and adopted the management budget in May. Uh, therefore, it is a recommendation uh, of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the 2018 fiscal year 2018-2019 budget as published, which includes a total property tax levy of $97,842,147 for 2019 compared to $93,685,073 in 2018 and does hereby certify said budget to the county clerk of Johnson County, Kansas for the collection in the manner prescribed by law and I would make that motion. We have a motion and a second. Oh no, we have a motion. Second. Is there a second? <laughs> Paul Snyder seconds. Any questions? 
Any questions? Are we going to have any presentation at all, not so much for us, but for the public about what this includes? Was there, an, I mean, the, the assumptions in this budget? Well, I think we did uh, in previous board meetings. We, we have in previous board meetings. I'll just make some comments sure. then, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Please. Uh, because I think those assumptions are important. Uh, the assessed valuation in the county increased by 7%. Um, we initially, in our budget guidelines last December, recommended lowering the mill levy by 0.1 mill based on what we thought the increase would be in assessed value. And every 1% increase in assessed value, 1% 1, 1 change in assessed value brings us $897,000 right. without changing our mill levy. So we agreed that we were going to have another large increase in assessed value. We should consider lowering the mill levy by 0.1. Um, the increase turned out to be significantly more than we thought, and so we're lowering the mill, the recommendation is to lower the mill levy by 0.25 mills, a quarter of a mill, to get us the same amount of revenues that we thought we were going to get in December. That's correct. So. Uh, we're, we're getting the money we thought we needed in, in December, and we're going to cut our mill levy by 0.25, um, which I think is, is extremely important because the taxpayers of Johnson County, we've heard some of the issues with, with folks who've seen their mill levy gone up or their assessed valuation go up, um, and, and it, as it, their assessed valuation goes up, their taxes go up whether anybody raises their mill or not. So I think it's important that we lower our mill levy. Um, it is important to me, and the more I've done business and done charities and been on public boards to, I've learned that the most important test for most people is how you treat other people's money. Um, because if you don't treat other people's money like you would your own, then you just want to spend it. And this isn't our money. Um, it's not our money to spend just because we could get that extra $2.6 million, which we're going to send back to the taxpayers. So I'm pleased. I, I would, I, I wouldn't be I, would, I wouldn't be able to argue against an even greater mill levy it, decrease given um, the resources that we already have and the fact that we're, we're going to receive $7.5 million in total unrestrict, current fund unrestricted amounts over last year, uh, $4.2 million in new tax money even with the mill levy decrease. Uh, we. Our reserves are in very good shape, and for all of those reasons, I, I will support a quarter mill levy. Um, and as I said, if somebody wanted to argue for more, I couldn't argue against it. I think the, the administration has done a good job in putting this together. It's been worked on since last September. Um, everybody's had input, and I hope uh, everybody will support this budget. Any other comments or questions from trustees? We have a motion on the floor. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. We have one uh, no. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my, uh, by the way, thank you. Uh, our final recommendation is for the transfer of funds. Uh, the Centers for, for Sustainability has requested that $12,000 from recycling proceeds be transferred to the Johnson County Community College Foundation to be used for scholarships. Therefore, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees authorize the transfer of $12,000 from the Sustainability Initiatives Fund to the Johnson County Community College Foundation to be used for student scholarships, and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and second. a We have a motion and a second. Uh, Musil was first. Trustee Cross, thank you. Um, any questions? I object. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? You object to the questions or object to the second? I just want to clarify. Uh, I, was being silly. I know. All in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I would say, Trustee Lindstrom, I used to keep a running tally of that number, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's getting larger every year from the sustainability of scholarships, and we appreciate that very much. Terrific job. Um, that almost concludes my report, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would ask uh, Trustees Musel or Schneider and or Schneider if they had anything to add or any comments. You've done a superb job as always. I agree. <laughs> any other questions of the <laughs> any any other questions of the management committee? Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, President's recommendations. Treasurer's report. Lee. Uh, 
Trustee Ingram has the report unless you want to give it over the phone. I, I asked her if that's all right. Uh, Trustee Ingram, yeah. I, I appreciate it. Yep, she's ready. They know. <laughs> Uh, the treasurer's report, the board packet contains the preliminary unaudited treasurer's report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2018. <coughs> this preliminary report does not include all of the college's fiscal year ended adjustments. Some of note, some items of note, excuse me, include page one of the treasurer's report is the general post-secondary technical education fund summary. Fiscal 2018 general fund revenues increased by 4.3% over fiscal 2017, primarily due to the higher property tax revenues, resulting from increases in assessed valuation in Johnson County. The general PTE funds expenses for fiscal 2018 were approximately 134 million compared to 131 million in fiscal 2017, an increase of 2.5%. An ad valorem tax distribution of 39,507,000 $957 was received from the county treasurer during June as recorded as follows. The general fund total was $37,273,760. Special assessment fund was $140,302. Capital outlay fund was $2,093,895. And the total, again, $39,507,957. The college's unencumbered cash balance as of June 30th, 2018 in all funds was 123 million, which is approximately 14.3 million higher than at the same time last year. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within approved budgetary limits. The recommendation, and it is the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the treasurer's report for the month ended June 30th, 2018, subject to audit. And Wait, I so move. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. Uh, any questions? Any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Do you have more or is that it? I believe that's it. Okay, it is it. I was just asking. Oh, that concludes. <laughs> uh, monthly report to the board, Dr. Sopcic. Thank you, Trustee Cook. Sorry. Um, first of all, you have your monthly report to the board. Uh, I'd like to point out the very first item here, which is the Cavalier Meal Share Program. You know, please note that in the spring, um, we had 74 individual, individuals who uh, received food on campus. Uh, food insecurity is a, is a big issue across the country at many community colleges, and it's, it's terrific that our campus is pursuing this. I spoke with Claudia this, um, today, and she said the applications for this semester were up to about, like, I think around 130. So the, you know, for the students to come to school and to do well in, in, in school here, it also says here 91% self-reported positive effect on academic report, uh, performance, which just makes a lot of sense that if you're decently, if you have decent food, um, you can do better in the classroom. So uh, kudos to the, to the college for executing this type of program. Um, I'd like to, to, to talk a little bit about the HLC, the Higher Learning Commission. Um, I spoke yesterday at in-service how, um, thanks to the hard work, John, Sherry, and the entire campus, we received our 10-year accreditation, which is always the ultimate goal whenever you pursue this type of thing. What I would like to do, though, is that you know, we have some work we have to do. And they laid out some challenges for us, and we have a year to file a report. And so I will read verbatim from the letter um, that came from Barbara Gelman Danley, who's the president of the Higher Learning Commission. So our interim report is due on 9-1-2019, and there are three basic issues that will be um, taken into account for this report. Uh, the first one is a report outlining the academic governance structure, including academic leadership, academic and faculty committees, and faculty, including adjunct faculty, to include communication processes and protocols between the committees, leadership, and faculty. The second element of the report is the outline of shared governance protocols and communication between faculty, academic leadership, and JCCC leadership. And the third um, component of this is an outline of decision-making protocols as well as communication protocols when decisions are final. It's a great opportunity for us to get this down, and I think Dr. McLeod kicked this uh, off today uh, in his meeting with the faculty but we think it'll be a very, very uh, productive exercise. In the end, it will make us stronger. 
So we look forward to um, getting this wrapped up by September of uh, 2019. Yes, Trustee Lawson. Coming back to the meal share program, how, what's the eligibility? How does someone, you said 130 applicants. I know that they, re that's a great question. Uh, thank you. I, I know that they review every single applicant because Claudia was sharing the, the, I guess, just the frustration of having to say no to some people who, who, who really need who really need food. Is it income-based or so I'm not sure, but oh, we'll okay. get that information. Sure for you. That's a great question. Through the foundation. The foundation plays a big role in funding in funding, funding this program. Yeah. And we're not alone. Community colleges across the country are addressing this issue. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, give a little bit of my time up tonight to talk about enrollment. And so John, I'm going to ask um, please take the podium and give us kind of an overview of where we stand this semester. Thank you, Dr. Sopcich. Um, I'm going to be going through a lot of data in, in a more rolled up summary format. So you have some stuff in front of you that we provided to you. We have a book and then a, a one page sheet there at your station. Um, I'm going to try to attempt to put some narrative around this data, help you guys put it in some context. And uh, so hopefully I'll answer all your questions as I go through it. Um, but if not, I'd love to answer those at the end of the of the presentation here. So I'm going to talk about two different areas. The first one's going to be uh, current trends, um, where, where are we at this fall, and then I'm uh, going to take a focus and a look at some of the historical trends that's, that's going on with the college. So the first uh, one I want to talk about is the uh, current trends. And if you want to look at the one-page sheet um, there at your station, you'll actually have that in front of you. And I'll go through and highlight a few things off of this. It's actually in a lot more detail than what I'm going to cover here today. The first one I'm going to look at is the first chart on the front page, and this is the uh, trend line um, on a day-to-day -day basis that we actually capture every day in the Institutional Research Office. Um, it's showing a, well, that we're going to be down 2.3% this coming fall at the same point in time of what we were last year. Um, one of the challenges with this is the aspect that uh, we are, uh, just did our drop for non-payment, and part of that is, is we actually implemented a wait list this year to where students can actually sign up for a class in a waitlist format, and if somebody ahead of, ahead of them drops, they can actually join in and, and sign up for that class in their place. So what happens with drop for non-payment, the students drop out, they go to the bottom of the, of the list to, to get registered for that class, and the students are on the waitlist jump in. They have 24 hours to respond once they've been noti notified. So that's actually slowing down a little bit, little bit of our trend of the quick enrollment where in the past, I believe it was 9 p.m. or 9 a.m., one of the two, the students, it was just a free-for-all, and whoever could get in there first could get the class. So now it's, there's some order and some process to it. So it's actually slowing down a little bit, our recovery, but I think over the long term, it's a better experience for the students on registration. Um, it's, a, it's a better process for the college to, to go through, and uh, I, I think in the long run, it will actually have a better experience and, and better enrollment. One of the nice things about this is the Academic Affairs Branch is now able to monitor supply and demand. So as we're going through this, they can look at the late wait list and say, oh, we have a, a 15 students signed up on a wait list for Comp 1 at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. Should we offer another section? Do we have space for that? Do we have teachers for that? So there's some supply and demand that we can do in the interim to possibly open up and meet the students' needs. At deadline, we had over 4,000 credit hours sitting there in the wait list. So kind of just kind of give you an idea of of how many students have actually signed up for, for waitlisting. It's, it's quite, quite a new experience for the college. Um, one of the things I think this will do is this will actually create a new normal for us. Um, our enrollment trends and, and the process by which we go through and as we track this, we're having to learn um, because it's, it's creating a change in, in experiences for the students. One of the things I think we'll find out is we'll actually end up dropping less students in the future for, for lack of, of setting up payment plans. So. Um, it's, it's, it's a new thing and, and we're, we're trying to learn. The second chart below that is looking at our credit hours. This is a chart I know Barbara looks at very closely because this is a direct correlation with our tuition income, our tuition revenue that we, that we bring in. So um, it is showing down a little bit more, it's 4.4% down. Um, but we think over time as those students get through that waitlist process, those will actually narrow a little bit um, and be, be a little closer to, to I think we're gonna be down, but probably not 4.4 down as we're looking right now.
This next chart here, if you want to flip that sheet over on the back, we're going to talk a little bit about the about race and ethnicity breakout. So this is looking at this fall 2018 or upcoming. One of the things I want to highlight here is the Hispanic enrollment, um, showing at the same point in time. So if you look at that comparable trend, um, so that's looking at the same point in time last year. We're actually up 77 Hispanic students on campus. So that's what that, that green 77 means. I think this is a, a great trend given the environment in which you're operating in right now. I think the college has done a lot of great work to reach out to that population and, and really pull those students in and help them make, make them more at ease about being participating within higher education. Yeah, why is Native Hawaiian broken out? That's a, the, these classifications are actually determined by the federal government. Really? And so that's um, about 10 years ago, I think, they went through and did a whole reclassification. You'll notice up there there's two or more races. That was actually a new classification. They wanted to start tracking the multi-race um, populations. Wait, send a recruiter to Hawaii. We're up 18 students. <laughs> Argo. <laughs> 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 I'm going in the middle. That's new. I think one of the things that's important off here is to look at the total minority population. So if we look at that, our total minority population, if you add up those, all those percentages there, we, cert, we have a minority population of 27.1%. So 27.1% of our student body is actually considered a minority. Anybody know what the Johnson County rate is? Yeah. Well, we're a little more diverse now. We're about 20, um, according to the latest uh, census estimates. So we're actually more diverse, which is what, we, is what our purpose and what our goal is as a community college. That's the population we want to reach out and serve. So we're, we're setting about 7% more diverse in, in which the county in which we serve. The next chart I want to uh, talk about is the student population. And the one I want to focus on here is the continuing education. As you notice, that's the one that we're taking the biggest hit in. It's our biggest population overall. So these are students who were enrolled last spring. And are they returning and registering this fall or not? So right now we have a uh, little over 8,500 students that were here last spring that have registered for classes this fall. While we're making great strides in our retention and graduation rate, they are focused on primarily the full-time, first-time degree-seeking students. This number here actually includes all students. It doesn't matter if you were a first-time or not uh, when you came to Johnson County. Our mission staff are really focused on how can they convince these students they need to register and enroll. <coughs> some of the, there are some good reasons why they may not. Uh, could be that they've accomplished their goals. You know, they've graduated. They've transferred on to another institution. They've came back and got some skill sets and are now out in the workforce. Speaking of that, that is one of the biggest challenges we face today. The unemployment rate in Johnson County is 3%. That's considered full employment. And community college's um, <coughs> enrollment acts the same as, as unemployment. So as unemployment goes down, community college enrollment goes down. And so that's, that's one of the challenges we face is how do we convince students who can go out and get a job that make a, a livable wage, how do we convince them that they need education to continue and to actually improve their life. So that's a challenge that we face. Um, in a July 29th, 29th article from the Wall Street Journal stated that employers are actually abandoning their preferences for college degrees and, our spe and specific skill sets to speed up the hiring process and to get a larger can uh, pool candidate, larger pool of candidates. So we're facing that, that employers are having a tough time finding employees, so they're, they're lowering the credential requirements. Um, for, for certain areas. Last one I want to talk about here is the uh, locations. And uh, as, as we notice here, uh, online continues to be very strong for the college. We're continuing to grow. As, as you can see here, we've got 165 more credit hours. Um, so it's not a lot of students, but uh, there's 165 more credit hours right now. It, it has been the one here the last couple of years that has continued to grow for the college. The other thing I wanted to point out here is right now we have no college now or quick step enrollment. So we still have over 20,000 credit hours yet to come in that category alone. Those students will start registering here over the next couple weeks. Um, and by the time census comes, we should have probably close to 22,000 credit hours just from our college now students. John, will that be completed by September 15th? Uh, census is, <laughs> I don't have it on here. Be the twentieth day of the semester. Is it on there somewhere? Um, well, it says since it's S September seventeenth. 
Yeah, September 17th will be census. It actually runs at five o'clock on that night, and then we'll start running reports the next day. So it'll be probably a couple days after that before we have the final numbers. Yeah. Do, do you project these numbers at outgoing years? Not, not good projections yet. We've actually, if you look, notice in the very back of your document, we're starting to try to look at how do we project just our overall enrollment number. Um, and so we've um, had a new researcher come on board that's actually um, a meteorologist by trade. And so he's using some different meteorolo meteorological modeling to help us do some of that. So it's kind of interesting to go through that. So we're really just starting to scratch the surface on being able to predict where we're at. Last year, his model um, predicted it within 91 students. So per pretty decent, considering we have 19,000, roughly 19,000 students. So, so we're just starting to, to get into that. All right, let's talk about some historical trends. So this is going to be looking uh, at the last five years worth of completed data. And that would be in the book, the, the bound book that we have at your place there. I want to first focus on a, a summary by division of our fall enrollment headcount. This would be on page 13 through 20 of your document. Um, these summaries are not actually in there, but the individual lines are. If you, if you actually look through the detailed information, there, the details are there. Um, we just didn't provide a summary this year. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is actually looking at our grand total line and the undecided line. The undecided line is primarily consists of our college now and our high school students. And so if you'll notice, as you notice as you go across there, we, we continually grew until last year. And then at uh, census last year, we, were, we dropped by about 300 students. That's primarily the, the conflict that we had with the college now enrollment with the, with the cut scores. Those students didn't actually get registered until after census date. So when you adjust that up by 300 students, our overall five-year change is only 7% decline, okay? So that it says 9% because that's what it actually was as of census, which is just kind of an arbitrary point in time that colleges use to measure uh, each other against. But when you actually adjust that for the 300 students that, we, that would have normally been there, we're, we're down 7% over the last five years. I'm all about benchmarks. So how, did, how does that compare against the nation? So nationally, community colleges across the nation have suffered a 14% decline in enrollment over the same time period. So we're half, we're, we're, we're experiencing half the decline of what community colleges across the nation are experiencing over that same time period. Yes? What would the greatest, uh, uh, the, the best numbers be? As far as? In, in your national comparisons, are there any colleges who are seeing increases? I didn't actually look at the individual colleges. I'm sure there are some that, that are experiencing some increases. Are there any regions of the country that are experiencing? It's pretty well nationwide. On, I, I do know that, that it's nationwide that are experiencing the decreases in it. I'm sure there are individual colleges that have you know, certain circumstances that affect them. The study I looked at was actually just a nationwide looking at raw number of students totally for the nation. So I, it didn't actually break it out by college. So one of the things I wanted to point out here is our liberal arts and sciences. These are our transfer degrees. So these are where students are coming to us and are intending to transfer on to a four-year institution. If you notice there, we're, we're flat. So we're, we're, you know, we're sli actually slightly up, but when you calculate the percentages, it calculates out as flat. So we have maintained this population very, very strongly um, over the last five years. So that's not where we're experiencing our decline. So I also wanted to point out here is our com uh, computer science and information technology areas has actually experienced a 22% growth in their enrollment. So this is an area where industry is re still requiring those credentials and the uh, college has actually re responded in a way to, to increase those enrollments. Now, when you look at it, there's not a lot of enrollment to begin with, so you have, do have some small ends to take into consideration in the big picture, but it's still, still a growth area. But then what's left when we look at the others, all the other ones are career and technical education areas. They're all struggling to keep that enrollment. Um, most of them are, I think all of them are experiencing double digit declines in enrollment, which is, is kind of scary. So we start digging in and, and looking at the data. I know we're gonna go a little bit more in depth on this at the uh, retreat, but one of the things that we discovered in the last four years 
that our non-traditional age students, so those that are 24 years and older, have declined by 23.4% at the college. So we're hemorrhaging students that, that are in that non-traditional age range. Why is that? Those are the students that are finding work. They, they have life experiences, life things that they need to have that income coming in. And so they'd rather go work than have that education. When we look at our under 18, we're actually growing by 9.7%. So our, our, our high school age students and that traditional age students, we've grown by 5.8% over four years. So we're doing well there. We're meeting those needs of those students. We're continuing to grow those populations. But it's in our non-traditional age. One of the things I do want to mention in your books, you'll notice that it's actually listed out by individual programs. And so you, if you see dashes in there, those, the, the dashes underneath the, a year, that means that there's no data for that program. So if you see that at the fall, like in the early ones, the fall 12, the fall 13, those are programs that were not in existence at that point in time that started at some point in time along those five year trend. Mm -hmm. If you see it at the back end side where it's like fall 16, fall 17, those are programs that we have decided to reorganize or decided to discontinue. And so that will give you an idea of the faculty are focused in through, their, through our program review process, which we started five years ago, looking to make sure that our curriculum and our, our, student, our programs are be maintaining relevance within the community, that we're serving the community that we need to serve and, and meeting their needs. Okay, the next one um, focus on here is gonna be the academic year credit hour by division. So this is looking at credit hours versus headcount. It kind of provides a different sp perspective for us, helps us understand full-time versus part-time students, how, how many hours students are taking, and it actually allows the academic branch to better understand faculty load. So where are students actually taking their, their courses? And of course, you know, Barbara's interested in this one always because this one directly ties to with tuition dollars and revenue that are coming in. It actually helps the college do better budgeting. We can align budgets and, and align personnel decisions along with this. Uh, highlighted college now up here continue, continues to be one of the rapidly growing areas of the college. It's currently near t nearly 10% of the credit hours generated by the college, okay? The interesting piece of that, it's over 20% of the headcount. So we have a lot of part-time students is what that tells us that are college now students that are taking one or two, two dual credit classes at the college. So this affects workload in the student success and engagement areas. They have to register more students to get the same number of credit hours. The other area I was going to point out here is the, uh, once again, the computer science and information technology area. And they are continuing to see over that five year uh, time frame, continue to see a strong growth in their credit hour generation um, of over 22%. The last one I want to talk about here is the degrees and certificates awarded by division. So this is, this is where we're actually putting students out in the workforce with degrees or, and or indoor certificates. But one of the caveats here that I need to point out to you is that if a student receives multiple degrees, both degrees are counted here. So if, if they would happen to receive a degree in business and, a degree, and, a, and also receive a, a transfer degree, both degrees would be counted, okay? So there, there is some duplication in count here. But one of the things I wanted to highlight here is our, our transfer degrees. Even though we've maintained basically the same amount of population, we're actually producing more transfer degrees. And so we've grown that over, um, over the last five years by uh, tw 29%. So that's, that's a lot of things have gone into that. Um, we've we've done, uh, in, uh, implemented things such as uh, um, in reverse transfer and auto grad things uh, where we're actually allowing students to transfer courses back into us so we can finish up their associate degree if they're missing one or two or three courses. And then auto grad, we actually go out and peruse our data and try to find students who are eligible to graduate and just have never applied to graduate and, and work with them to try to get them to graduate. Last thing I want to point out here is the total number of degrees that we actually have awarded. Um, while we're experiencing these enrollment challenges, students are completing. Over the last five years, we have increased the number of degrees awarded annually. While I can't say there's a causation relationship, I can definitely say that there's a direct cor correlation with the efforts of the faculty and staff here at the college to help students be successful. We, we truly work to, to make students successful here. So I have three takeaways for you today is our current enrollment. Uh, we've implemented the waitlist process 
And uh, we have ch new patterns that are evolving and changing, um, creating a new normal for us. Um, in our historical trends, we're outperforming the national trend. Even though it's negative, we're, we're still outperforming that. And our program review process is working. It's keeping us relevant. And the last one is un understanding our audiences. We're really, truly trying to work hard to understand our audiences. We've figured out the high school and traditional students. We've been able to do some great marketing. I know you've heard in the past of some efforts that Chris Gray and his team have done on marketing differently to those students. We're, we're making inroads there. We're still, we're still challenged to figure out where our non-traditional students and how can we motivate them to come back even though there's the low unemployment rate. At this point in time, I'll take any questions that I can answer for you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for a very nice report. Mm -hmm. um, I want to refer to this page uh -huh. and the uh, page three of the booklet just so I understand. If somebody asks me what's the enrollment this fall, is it 18,638? So this booklet here is fall 2017, so it'll be last fall. So this is a historical perspective in the book. This is the upcoming fall 2018 enrollment. Okay, so that 18,638, it says, isn't that academic year 18? Let me get the right page here. Yeah, but we're in academic year 19. We're in academic year 19. So it's fall 18. So academic okay. years are spanning the so, all three terms. So uh, this sheet then is, mm -hmm. what's our head count this fall? What are, we, what are we expecting this fall? As of right now, our head count as of this morning, so it would be as actually of last night, is 13,241. Okay, that's what, that's what I got. So that, are you saying then that, where do we get down I'm, I'm trouble. I'm having trouble understanding where we're only down 2.3 percent. So at the same point in time compared to last year. So we do it. We captured the data every day last year, and so we're comparing last night's number to the same point in time last year in the term, and we're down 2.3 percent compared to that same okay, point so, in time. So look at look. I've at, always so, understood we're around 18 or 19,000 yeah, so students. It, look, at your, look, look at your high school students enrolled a year ago today and look at your high school students enrolled today. Okay, let me ask you this. What's the difference between a high school student and college now? Because we list on this sheet yeah. 420 high school students, but we list no credit hours. So a high school student would be the population student. The college now would be the credit hours. So that's where sometimes those look a little bit different. The high school students enroll in the college now credits. So they're on, that's why they're on two different reports there. So, well, high, high school students include those students that actually take classes on campus as but, well. So high school students take primarily the College Now yeah. credits, but a high school student may, may take an online course for us in which yep. they take a regular sociology class. So tomorrow if somebody asks me how many students you have at JCCC, is the number 13,421? We're anticipating around 19. How are we anticipating? Is our enrollment There's, today? That's your enrollment that, today. 10,421. Is that right? That's your enrollment report. Yes. That, that's your enrollment report as of today. As of today. But it, it'll, it, I, we'll run this report again in the morning, and it will have today's enrollees in there. So okay, how about two weeks from today? It'll it'll have. More will it be near in 18,000? Yes, it will be. So if if on this, if you look at the census column. It says that we're missing five. We're down 5,397 students. Correct. We're expecting Today, them to show up. We're expecting those that number of students to enroll between now and census. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. The report. Thank you very much, Joe. Anything else? That's terrific. Thank you, John. That wraps up the report for tonight. Okay. I got. I have. For the questions later. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. I'll find my place. Um, reports from board liaisons. Well, we have no old business or no new business, so board liaisons, uh, faculty association, Dr. Harvey. Hello. Oh, well, this week is, um, we call it our professional development days, which means it's exhausting. <laughs> But it's uh, packed with a lot of things. It's really nice to have all the faculty back. At least I feel that way, and I'm excited to see my students next week. Um, first, I want to talk about faculty development. Last week, I spent a day at a JCCC STEM faculty retreat. It was hosted by our grants, leadership, and development, and our faculty development offices. And there were 34 faculty in attendance all day at this. And it's kind of amazing that we had 34 faculty, because I have to tell you, it was our very last week of summer. And 
you know, it, it wasn't the promise of lunch that would get people here, but it was, um, it was the, the, the opportunity for a very specialized, specific um, faculty development opportunity that day. So um, 34 faculty were there, and it was a fantastic opportunity. It, and I took with me ideas that I plan to use for a new assessment project in one of my classes, um, ideas for how to help my students evaluate and improve their own study habits um, in my course, like after, to reflect on what they did to prepare for a test and what they could do differently next time. So it was a lot of really practical, useful information. One of the highlights for me in getting to talk to some of the faculty that I don't often see uh, was I got to have a conversation with um, one of our welding faculty and we were sharing stories in between sessions and he was describing the feeling that he has when a student first makes a successful weld for the first time. And he was just saying, you know, they're so excited, like, look at this, you know. And he's like, I'm so excited inside, probably more than they are, because um, he realizes that he has taught them the skill that they are going to have to build on for a career, for their life. And uh, sort of that um, teach a man to fish type idea. And it's this kind of thing, you know, getting to talk to my colleagues and meet with other faculty and hear about stories about students and what inspires them, but also talk about our problems and sort of try to solve them together and get ideas. That's, it's really important for us to have those opportunities. So I really appreciate the college funding that, that day. Um, this week on Tuesday afternoon, we had a faculty symposium. And it was full of some amazing presentations by our peers. They presented scholarly research and they shared educational research and ideas and tips for the classroom. We, have, we do have amazing faculty and um, it's always inspiring to learn things from them. One presentation I saw was about research into how students prepare and perform on proctored versus unproctored exams for an online course. And uh, one of my colleagues is doing some more research into that, sort of looking at how much do the students learn, what do they do differently to prepare when they know it's going to be proctored versus unproctored. Um, you know, a lot of people are trying to look at what level are they, to what extent are students cheating, more so or less so if it's a proctored or unproctored environment. So that's some interesting research to be done in that because there is an ex extra expense in proctoring an online exam and there's a lot of um, disagreement about you know what what's the best way to teach students in an online course so anyway that was one of the presentations I went to another one was on the educational rights of children and the the context was what part of it was homeschooling um, but it was just thinking about it from a child's perspective and what is there what are their educational rights the only disappointment that I had Tuesday afternoon was that I couldn't attend all of them because I could only go to a couple of them because they were at the same time. But it was all, it was very good and I think um, it's a testament to our, our professional development office that they are listening to faculty and, and making very um, relevant opportunities for us to, to learn and improve and share ideas. Last spring, uh, we concluded an AQIP project on faculty development and I happened to chair that committee we made lots of recommendations to the cabinet, and they've been implementing our recommendations. And I'm very excited to see the directions that they're taking with faculty development. So it's important for our college to maintain our academic excellence and our innovation as an institution. So this, is, um, this was a real positive thing that I'm seeing change in. Shared governance, of course, has been mentioned this week, as it was tonight. And I was glad to hear you talk about sort of our shared responsibility in that. Um, I think we recognize, and we hope you guys recognize, that there's plenty of responsibility and room to go around um, in, in making that better. And, um, and that that is shared. So we're going to own our part, and we want the other levels of responsibility at the college to own theirs, too. So we're looking forward to working together and find the best solutions for our institution. We are currently at impasse in contract negotiations. One administrator said to me earlier this week, what a year to be president of the Faculty Association. <laughs> With all these things 
going on and starting off. Um, but I have to say that I feel very supported by faculty. And it was great to see our faculty come back this week. Despite the fact that no one is ready for Monday yet and they will all be working every evening and all weekend long to get ready. Um, we had a large turnout today at a meeting to discuss negotiations. And I have never experienced this level of collegiality that I have since I started serving in this position. We are committed to continue to negotiate. We are also very committed to ensuring that we can continue to attract and retain the amazing faculty that we have here. You know, our students and the citizens of Johnson County deserve a spectacular institution. And so we're always thinking of ways that we can keep it that way. So I don't know if you know this, but our salary table gives larger increases to younger faculty than older. And it's because of a number of years ago where we had uh, problems with certain parts, certain groups being underpaid. And so to avoid that, we, we have a salary table that way. So when we do talk about a certain percentage, that's not what everyone gets. We're looking at high inflation rates, uncertainty about which direction that's going to go, and being asked to negotiate for three years into the future is, is a big responsibility. So like I said, we are committed to attracting and retaining exceptional faculty for this community college. So we have been assigned a med federal mediator now and we look forward to working towards a contract. On a less controversial note, we gave an award this week, and thanks for pointing that out, Trustee Lawson. We awarded Dr. Larry Reynolds, Dean of English and Communications Division, the Distinguished Administrator Award, because Larry has taken on a whole extra division, and it was won under unusual circumstances this year for an entire year, and he did it in such a way that I have to say at the end, the faculty in, in the division that he was helping kind of wanted to keep him. But um, it was a very well-deserved award, and it was, it was a privilege to get to honor him in that way on behalf of our association. And last but not least, you're invited to our party tomorrow night. You can come and meet some of our faculty and ask them what they plan to do this semester different in their classes. And I'm sure you'll learn all kinds of interesting things, and um, it would be fun to see them. So if you are available and like to come, I know we've sent the details, so you're all welcome. And that concludes my report. Thanks, uh, Dr. Harvey. Appreciate it. Any questions or comments? Regular place. Same time, same Regular place. Time. Same time, same place. <laughs> and and um, barbecue, Casey Joe's. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Um, I had a chance to be here a little bit yesterday, and um, it was it was um, uh, really positive to see the pin recognitions, the years of service recognitions, and to think about all of the faculty and the number of years, and then to have that culminated with the Wall of Honor ceremony uh, for our two professors and the number of years they've contributed, and all of the people that they that the faculty has impacted and continues to impact. So uh, thanks for your good leadership and thanks for your good work and. Um, yeah, maybe it isn't the best of years to be president of the Faculty Association, but you're doing a great job. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Harvey. I have my pin. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Congratulations. Uh, Johnson County Education Research Triangle, Trustee Lindstrom. Mr. Chairman, it's a very brief report again this evening. Uh, once again, we last met on Monday, May 7th at KU Edwards campus, and uh, our next meeting is November 7th uh, at the K-State Olathe campus out at uh, Innovation Drive in Olathe. Um, the only thing I, I, I do want to report on sales tax, and uh, Mr. Carter mentioned that sales tax uh, statewide were down. I think he just he may have just left. Okay. And, um, but not in Johnson County. Uh, Johnson County Sales tax in July were one million five hundred and sixty-nine thousand five hundred and eighty-three dollars and forty-nine cents, which is uh, more than eight and a half percent over the same period last year. Last month was fifteen percent over the previous year as well. For the year, it's trending about uh, well over two and a half percent. It's trending up. Uh, so sales tax in Johnson County are, are strong. 
Thank you. Any questions of Trustee Lindstrom? Uh, Kansas Association of Community Colleges, Trustee Ingram. Yes, I do not have a report. We have not met since June, but the next meeting will be at Highland Community College on September 14th and 15th. If you have interest to travel to the beautiful northeast part of Kansas, uh, up to Highlands Community College, that would be a very good trip to take. Thank you. Foundation, Trustee Ingram. And I do have a report. The Foundation has a social event coming up on Thursday, August 23rd from 4.30 to 6 p.m. in the BNSF Training Center. All trustees and cabinet members are welcome to join us for an exclusive tour of BNSF's Training Center led by Scott Schaefer, General Director, Training Services. Refreshments will be provided and we encourage the board and cabinet to invite members of the community who you may believe might be interested in attending. Please RSVP to the foundation at your convenience. Also for your calendars, we have the scholarship celebration luncheon on September 5th at noon. This is the annual gathering of foundation scholarship winners. We pass the mic and hear directly from students about their journey and the educational goals their scholarship helps them achieve at JCCC. We hope all trustees are able to attend this one hour event again at noon on Wednesday, September 5th. Planning efforts for our Some Enchanted Evening Gala continues to go very well. The event will be held November 10th, 2018, <coughs> Overland Park Convention Center, and will kick off our 50th anniversary celebration for the college. John and Christy Stewart are the chairs this year, and Drs. David and Mary Zamorowski are being honored as the 2018 Johnson Countyans of the Year. More than $625,000 has been raised to date, which is just shy of our all-time record, and it's only August. The steering committee has a goal of 750,000 and 85 tables. Individual ticket sales will soon begin, which will include a reduced rate for the very first time to encourage staff to participate in this special anniversary kickoff event. Finally, a warm welcome to our new director of the foundation, Rob Wyrick. Rob joined the team in July from the Olathe Health Charitable Foundation. Rob is already making a positive impact with the foundation team, and we are excited to have him join our team. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Any questions of Trustee Ingram? The next item is a consent agenda. It's, it's an item where we take action on a number of routine items. Uh, does anyone wish to pull an item off the consent agenda? Anyone wish to pull an item off? If not, I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We uh, do have an executive session this evening. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion to go in executive session for the purpose of discussing matters exempt from the Kansas Open Meetings Act relating to privileged conversations with legal counsel and the attorney-client relationship and consultations with the board's bargaining representation in employer-employee negotiations. This session will last 30 minutes. Uh, we would like to invite Joe Sopchik, Becky, Becky Sentelvier, Colleen Chandler, Gurbishan Singh, Jim Lane, Barbara Larson, Rachel Lears, Mickey McLeod, Randy Weber, Tanya Wilson, and Melody Rail to join this executive session. I would entertain a motion for such. So moved. Second. Motion by Musil, seconded by Ingram. Uh, we'll start the executive session at uh, seven at six forty-five at a quarter to seven. We are out of executive session. Back in open session. We will be going back into executive session. I would like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing matters exempt from the Kansas Open Meetings Act relating to privileged conversations with legal counsel and the attorney-client relationship and consultations with the board's bargaining representation and employer-employee negotiations. This session will last 25 minutes. We would like to invite Joe Sopchik, Becky Senelvier, Colleen Chandler, Gurbishan Singh, Jim Lane, Barbara Larson, Rachel Lears, Mickey McLeod, Randy Weber, Tanya Wilson, and Melody Rail to join this executive session, and I would like a motion to do I'll so. I'll make that motion with the caveat that we can always reconvene an open session before 25 minutes, but we have we, up to. We can. Do we have a, an Ingram seconds? And we're going to start at, uh, right now at 716. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are back in executive session. We are back in open session. We are out of executive session. No action was taken. Uh, 
Trustee Snyder, any closing comments in the open forum? No, sir. Trustee Lawson? Uh, the shared governance uh, with the HLC report, that was something that I'm looking forward to continuing to have updates on. Good, good. Trustee Musil? Um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Sopcich, McLeod, Weber, and Singh for their work on the assessment scores and their continued work. It hasn't gotten any easier since last fall. The results that we heard at Learning Quality that those students that we waved in without sufficient credentials did just as well as those students who made it on the assessment score vindicates everything you did for accessibility and the right thing for our students and our parents and our constituents. So thanks for having the courage to step up and do that and continue to do it. Same thing, Dr. Soptic Larson and Rachel Lears and your team on the budget. Um, nobody, everybody thinks this just happens, and I know it doesn't, so I just want to thank you for that. Trustee Lindstrom. Uh, thank you for your leadership and nice meeting tonight. Thank you. Trustee Engel. I don't have anything. I would just like to say that I would like to thank everybody uh, uh, that had any part uh, with the Welcome Back Week and faculty development, which uh, Dr. Harvey spoke uh, at length in her remarks. I thought your, your comments, Dr. Sopcich, at the welcome session uh, about the college and all the elements of the college on engaging, uniting, and transforming were right on target. I heard a lot of positive comments, and I want to thank everybody for the work. Uh, Dr. McLeod, the uh, work you're doing on shared governance uh, ahead of the uh, schedule in terms of uh, the Higher Learning Commission it was well thought out, and thank you very much. Good meeting. Uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.